Hey guys, welcome to our uh, first of four um, what we might call COVID-19 lectures. Um, the format for these lectures are going to be more or less me talking to you from behind a slideshow. So it's not the most, uh, I don't know, what a comfortable situation um, or, or entertaining or engaging. But we'll do our best, or I will do my best, and um, I will try to keep these lectures to hopefully less less than 90 minutes. Um, we'll see how it goes, though. Um, so let, let's just jump right in. We're, we're doing persons in relation, mother and child. How's it going? Hey, guys. Not bad. Let's talk now. John McMurray. Okay, so he was um, late 19th to late 20th century uh, philosopher, or lived through that time. Um, and he was Scottish, uh, and he spent most of his philosophical career, um, um, I don't know if fighting is the right word, but, but uh, sort of going against, uh, going after Descartes and ideas, subsequent ideas from Descartes of, of mind-body dualism. Um, he argued that the nature of, of humans is personal, not mechanical, or as we'll see in this um, text, organic, right? Not mechanical or organic. So you'll recall our, what we talked about Descartes, we talked about, um, well, about the, the egocentric predicament and about this mind-body dualism. Descartes had an idea that well, he wanted to get to first philosophy. What's the first foundation of our philosophy? What's the foundation of our knowledge? What's, what's that bedrock upon which we can stand to, to utter any truth at all, right? We need some kind of foundation to stand on. And Descartes went about the method of radical doubt. That was his methodology. You know, his epistemology was radical doubt. It was a radical deduction, you could say, where I can doubt everything, right? Everything around me, right? I can doubt you and you and this thing and that thing and all of being, let's say, um, and even my body, right? So what we get is a radical solipsism. Solipsism being that word we talked about last class, where, where I am an island, right? I am completely self-contained. I operate from within. I develop from within myself and need no sort of connections or relationship to the world outside me to become more or less who I am. Evolving, developing, destined, you could say, to become. I am totally imminent within myself. I don't touch the outside world in any necessary way that um, that has anything to say about my development as a as a human person so uh, so you'll recall that Descartes said we could we could doubt the world around us the people around us we could doubt even our own bodies but we could not doubt the doubter as it were we cannot doubt the thinking thought mind that is doubting because the very moment I'm doubting anything of course I am thinking so we can't doubt this. So that's the foundation we stand upon for Descartes. So, and, and, and that was largely what John McMurray had an issue with, was this idea of an imminent self, someone who is self-enclosed, self-contained, needs no relationships to the outside world. And yeah, that's a good place to begin to just dive into the classical view of rational development in the young. So for Aristotle, all right. So even going back before Descartes, there was an idea: humans are animals that become rational through a process of habit formation, and in this process, a character is formed. Um, character is an orderly organization of the original animal impulses, so that they no longer function independently as motives of behavior, but as elements in a system. In other words, character is nothing more than an organization of what is already there within us, imminent, formed into a system by the pressures that bear upon us as we grow up. Okay? 
So in this model, we could hypothetically be dropped as infants into the middle of the jungle for 10 years, like the Jungle Book or something, where our rationality would, like, would shape and systemize our impulses based on the external pressures we encounter. So just to break that down, in other words, we are animals with the same impulses as animals, except we, it, it has a, a somewhat of a rational character in that we're human persons. Um, so that at some point in our development, it's not going to be another person, i.e. mom, dad, whatever it might be, uh, that, 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 that has a say in our development or has a significant impact on our development, but it's going to be some rational agent within us ourselves that emerges and takes all those animal impulses that we'd had and just sort of reorganize, reorganizes them into something we call character and that character will will um, um, yeah uh, will 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 naturally de naturally develop whether we're in a jungle or whether in a society in a community um, so that's more or less the idea, the breakdown there. Um, an animal's basic impulses move him toward pleasure, happiness, delight. Likewise, a human's basic impulses move him toward happiness, pleasure, delight. However, because of the rational capacity that develops in humans and that organizes these impulses into a character, as we've said, the way in which we respond to these basic impulses looks a bit different. So, for an animal, we might then illustrate the characteristic difference between rational and non-rational behavior by saying that when an animal is hungry, it goes in search of food. But when a man is hungry, he looks at his watch to see how long it will be before his next meal. But this isn't really a, a, a real difference. We might say that it's the same thing differently expressed. In other words, in this conception, the development of the rational human person is as natural or organic as that of any other species. Okay, so the idea here is that that happiness and delight uh, and pleasure to which animals move, well, we have those same impulses too, but it has a rational character in us because we're humans, so it's expressed rationally. Whereas in animals, it's 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 expressed um, in their own way, it, as a cow would express it, or as a sheep would express it, and now in humans, as we would express it, which has a rational character. So in the same way, it's the same thing, right? We both organically grow into these animal impulses and sort of organize them or live with them in a different way. They they manifest themselves in us in different ways. These animal impulses. So, so Walt Whitman, for example, can say, I sound my barbaric yarp over the roofs of the world. And Monsieur Cow here says, moo. It's, 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 sorry, I'm being, I'm being funny here, but it's basically to say that, you know, humans are different in degree from animals, but not really in kind. We have different ways of expressing these basic impulses that move us towards happiness, pleasure, delight, etc. Um, but that's all they are, just differences in degree, not in kind. But McMurray says, no, not same. <laughs> Basically, this is not a difference in degree. This is a difference in kind entirely. We 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 develop in much different ways. The youth develop in much different ways than cows and sheep and and dogs, etc. So what we get here, uh, in my words here, uh, the way I've titled this, uh, is is we reduce ourselves with or to our own metaphors. McMurray writes: the root of the error is the attempt to understand the field of the personal on a biological analogy, and so through organic categories. The Greek mode of thought was naturally biological or zoomorphic. The Greek tradition has been strongly reinforced by the organic philosophies of the 19th century and the consequent development of evolutionary biology. This in turn led to the attempt to create evolutionary sciences in the human field, human field particularly in its social aspect.
So what's this, what this is saying, more or less, um, is that this organic biological model that the Greeks worked on, uh, worked with, um, what is more or less been reinforced by um, 19th century development of evolutionary biology. And what both these say is that the human is organic to some degree, is natural, grows of its own accord, right? Imminently unfolds. Um, and, well, let's just keep on reading. Contemporary thought about human behavior, individual and social, became saturated with biological metaphors and molded itself to the requirements of an organic analogy. It became the common idiom to talk of ourselves as organisms and of our societies as organic structures, to refer to the history of society as an evolutionary process and to account for all human action as an adaptation to environment. Now, importantly, okay, so what, the, what we're saying here is that the biological analogy, right, to how humans, how persons develop, the, this, this analogy to plants and animals is, it hasn't really been seen through, okay? This analogy, do, do, do persons develop biologically or in some other way? Do persons develop in this evolutionary model? Or in some other way. Now we're not saying here. We're not saying, you know, we're not some Southern Baptist Alabama church who is saying that uh, evolution never existed. We're we're saying evolution is fine so far as it goes in biological categories. But can we say it is truly what develops persons in that personal field? Okay, that's what McMurray's arguing. Can this be um, justifiably uh, mapped on to? how persons um, develop. It was understood that this scientific way of looking at human development was empirical, that is, based on experiment experience. So we would look at plants and animals and we would say, well, this must apply to animals too, in that they are, you know, we have organic bodies, we're natural, we're of the earth, we come from here, we're not from aliens from another planet. So we would say, this this works to experience and experiment. It's empirical, but it is not empirical. It is a priori and analogical. Okay, so a priori just means um, um, based, not based on experience. It's a truth that can be verified, but it's, it doesn't need to be based on experience. Or sometimes it's not a truth that can be verified. It's a presupposition that we haven't noticed. Um, in any case, so so a priori knowledge is is like mathematical knowledge, right? Two plus two equals four. I don't need to take a swath of samplings from a population to understand that that's a universal principle, right? That two plus two will always equal four. Um, I don't need to experiment, experience that in a way. I, I, I just know it when I hear it in a way um, or when I've learned it. It presents itself to me. Um, in other words, we are starting with an a priori assumption here a presupposition that is not determined by experience or experiment. How we get this assumption is that we transfer our understanding of plants and animals onto the human person without really investigating if this can be done. We thus make an analogy where an analogy can so easily be made. Right? So again, analogy is comparing two things. We're comparing ourselves to plants and animals. Does this obtain? Does this make sense? We'll go on to see. Consequently, it is not in the strict sense even scientific, for this concept and the categories of understanding which go with it were not discovered by a patient, unbiased examination of the facts of human activity. They were discovered at best through an empirical and scientific study of the facts of plant and animal life. Okay, so here we are repeating what we've just said. They were applied by analogy to the human field on the a priori assumption that human life must exhibit the same structure. So... So that a priori, the presupposition that that human life must exhibit exhibit the same structure as plants and animals. Okay, so it's so, so in other words, an animal or a plant develops organically, ergo, so do human persons. Now let's go on to see what we're what what. Um, what we're talking about here. So to, to affirm the organic conception in the personal field is implicitly to deny 
the possibility of action. So here's our first argument against it. The, to affirm the organic conception in the personal field is implicitly to deny the possibility of action. Now to understand what McMurray says here, we have to understand what he means by act or action. All right. For McMurray, organisms, i.e. plants, animals, behave whereas persons act. Act implies the freedom to choose, to will this or that act. Okay. So it is therefore us as persons of free will who affirm, choose, will to understand ourselves as organic. This ability of free action already transcends the limits of the organic, for there is no free action in the organic. Okay? Thus we are doing something sort of silly. We are freely choosing to see ourselves as determined by behaviors. So you see the contradiction there. We are freely choosing to see ourselves as determined by behavior. Right? Now obviously if we can choose, we can choose, we can, we can transcend behavior in a sense, right? We freely choose to see something, um, sir, ourselves as determined by behaviors. So there's something wrong with that, and um, uh, that uh, McMurray um, is arguing. <clears throat> in the same sense, we are therefore we are imposing an ideal upon ourselves, some reductive idea in which we are tempted to see ourselves. I'm organic as the trees and the birds. We often like to think that, right? McMurray says, it becomes an ideal to be achieved. We say, in effect, society is organic. Therefore, let us make it organic as it ought to be. The contradiction here is glaring. If society is organic, then it is meaningless to say that it ought to be. For if it ought to be, then it is not. Right? So if we look at outside at our world and we think of the world as naturally organic and us as our human society are as organic and we need to make it more organic into be, so that we're organic we're, we're, we're contradicting ourselves around and around here because we're saying essentially that <laughs> for some reason we actually lay outside the organic that determined behavior that naturally of its own accord unfolds we are not um in that category we have stepped out beyond its margins. Now, McMurray calls this sort of error of thinking dangerous, and we know that most reductions of the person can run us into trouble. Um, for example, offending one of Crosby's four statements of the human person. But how much trouble could thinking of ourselves as merely organic really cause? I mean, you know, really. Boom, Nazis! So the Nazis were um, were 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 a, a group of people who saw themselves as organic, right? And this was a way that we uh, um, a way that they talked about what they called the Volkisch movement, the German uh, purity movement, the blood and soil movement. So the Volkisch movement was a German ethnic and national movement active from the late 19th century up until the Nazi era. This was erected on the idea of blood and soil, inspired by the one-body metaphor and the idea of naturally grown communities in unity. So the key theme of the Volkisch movement, a movement to be later adopted by the Nazi party, was that of organicism. There was, in this conception, a single historical and ideal Germanic, German, Germanic race organically united with each other, persons in blood, and the land, soil. The danger of this conception? Well, the danger of this conception was who was not organic? Who was not of the blood and soil? So, so organic, in a sense, has already sort of offended, we could say, two, um, two of Crosby's uh, positive statements about the human person. Now, firstly, when we assume that we're organic, we assume that we're determined by behaviors, okay? So when we say we're organic, determined by behaviors, that means what we're saying is that the organic is acting through our will. Something that is not us ourselves, that free creative center, is acting through us, right? That we aren't acting through ourselves, but, but this 
organic whatever this thing is is acting through us and determining our our behavior um, entirely so this of course offends Crosby's um, one of Crosby's four four positive statements or, or overall his notion of freedom that we're not that we we um, we belong to ourselves right we um, we act through our own selves, through our own will. Um, the other, the other um, one he offends here, or, or sorry, not he, um, the other one that's offended here by saying that we're organic, of course, is the one that, you know, happens to say the Jews or the gypsies or the homosexuals back in the Second World War. Who is not organic? Why the, well, those who aren't of Germanic purity, right? Who aren't of the blood and soil. So we can say foreigners, right? Or, or people who are, I don't know, I don't know all the Nazis' little uh, detailed descriptions, but, but we can say that here we're reducing um, people to organic, um, ends up in marginalizing certain people who are therefore declared non-persons, okay? So we see them not as incommunicable in themselves, we see them as specimens, right? A Jew, a gypsy, a homosexual, just these people, not not human particular people that we encounter to know. Okay, so we see how this organic to rephrase to, to or restate. We see how this organic understanding is yet another reduction of the human person. Just like um, you know, to say a human person is uh, is not. It, 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 the human person is physically able, right? That's a reduction because what happens to people who aren't physically able? Are they demoted? Are they no longer persons? Um, or we could say the human person is someone who has has a clear cognitive function. Oh, okay. Then well, what what happens to those with dementia, right? Or those who 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 are mentally disabled in some way or another? Are they demoted? Are they less than persons? So here we're coming back to that same line of understanding. The organic reduces us, right? It says that we aren't free persons. It says that something is determining us every moment of our lives that, um, and you know, it's true, there's determinants in the world that try to move us, but ultimately we are free people who will make a choice between things. Very much unlike plants and very much unlike animals who don't have that self-reflective ability, right? And I know Daryl's out there somewhere going, how do you know animals don't have self-reflective ability? <laughs> and, well, and, and, and feel free to bring that up at question period if that is a question you have. Um, but hopefully I've clarified that. Um, okay. So are we therefore not organic at all? Now, importantly, McMurray is not saying that we are not organic at all. We have bodies which develop and grow with little that our free action can do really do about it. We have smelly breath, toe jam, canker sores, eye infections, etc. What McMurray is saying is that we make an error when we judge the personal field as merely organic. In other words, uh, the body is organic, but the personal field is not. Okay. So there, there's something, there's something, there's something else at play here that we need to um, um, draw our attention to in the human person in order to really see um, the truth of our development as persons. Right? Do we develop in this natural, imminent way where we just unfold wherever we are, whether it's in the jungle or whether it's in our family, or, or is there? something more work in the personal field um, that has to do with relationship and that's of course where we'll go if you've done the reading you know this McMurray <clears throat> the organic conception of man excludes by its very nature all the characteristics in virtue in virtue of which we are human beings to include those characteristics we much must, must change our categories and start afresh from the beginning okay so let's Let's start from the beginning. I'm just going to take a sip of my tea here, guys. Sorry. I'm going to try, try to avoid pausing 
these slides, so it's just one nice fluid lecture. Um, it can get really choppy if uh, for each slide I, I, I do a, a separate recording. So anyway, here I go. So just how non-organic are we? Um, oh, and I'll just make another comment. Uh, my kids are running around somewhere in this house, and they could at any moment barge in here and make a lot of noise. So if that happens, forgive me. There's also construction going on right out my window. I hope you guys can't all hear that that uh, um, that drill as loudly as I can. Okay, <clears throat> so just how non-organic are we? If we were to encounter something like organicism in human life, McMurray argues, it would likely be revealed to us in the earliest moments of that life. In other words, babies. So babies, for instance, are useless. They are helpless. They can do nothing for themselves. And we all know this, right? There's always that, we always, you know, we look at that horse who's born in those nature documentaries and we're just in five minutes it stands up and we're just like, blah, what? And I guess if you've ever been a parent before, you know how frustrating that is <laughs> to see when your own infant child is six months old and still puking and burping and, and, and totally defenseless and almost suffocating itself every day in the mattress you you just you watch that horse baby come out of that horse and you're just like wow with envy <laughs> doesn't that's not to say i wish i was a horse not all the time at least okay so the infant he has no power of locomotion nor even of coordinated movement the random movements of limbs and trunk and head of which he is capable do not even suggest an unconscious purposiveness. The essential physiological rhythms are established and perhaps a few automatic reflexes. Apart from these, he has no power of behavior. He cannot respond to any external stimulus by a reaction which would help to defend him from danger or to maintain his own existence. Okay. Instinctive behavior. We therefore suppose behavior to be this or that organic response, which lends a creature some sort of competency with its environment, in the way a foal, as I've said, immediately tries to stand up once born, or in the way in which a chick hatches its own egg. Right? So, okay, another way McMurray terms behavior is as an instinct or instinctive behavior, denoting a specific adaptation that does not require to be learned. Okay, So things that come prepackaged within us. The term specific here means sufficiently definite to fulfill its biological function. So there's a specific adaptation that does not require to be learned, let's say, in, in the horse. Right? Immediately stands up. No one ever told him he needed to but he seems to just go about it, right? Um, likewise, as, as McMurray talks about in the reading, uh, uh, you know, a baby bird hatches its own shell, right? It knows at a moment to break out. And even more mysteriously, when, when the mother bird calls, well, when the mother bird uh, makes a call of, you know, danger nearby or whatever it might be, the bird won't break through the shell, all right? Or will go quiet or whatever it is. Right? The, the just natural understandings, right? So a natural adaptation to the environment that does not require to be learned. So this is an instinctive behavior. Um, again, okay, so, so if this is what we mean by instinct, then it is clear that we are born with none, okay? All purposive human behavior has to be learned. To begin with, our responses to stimulus are, without exception, biologically random, says McMurray. Right? They have no specific adaptation function. Okay? No specific biological function that doesn't have to be un that has not, doesn't have to be learned to our environment, or, or so that has blah blah blah. Mix that word up. Um, um, so humans have none. Okay. Now, what is the upside to this helplessness? Is there anything um, that we come with that we are—I don't know what the word prepackaged with—you could say. 
The baby must be fitted by nature at birth to the conditions into which he is born, for otherwise he cannot survive. So, in a way, he is, in fact, adapted, says McMurray, but this is paradoxical. He is adapted to being unadapted, adapted to a complete dependence upon an adult human being. So if there's anything like instinct or prepackaged motivation, you could say, or prepackaged impulse or behavior, it's, 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 it's a total inability to survive within one's own environment, okay? It is uh, where it to totally... Um, unadapted um, to our natural environment. So he is made to be cared for, all right? So he has got a complete dependence upon an adult human being. He is made to be cared for in this idea. He is born into a love relationship, which is inherently personal. Not merely his personal development, but his very survival depends upon the maintaining of this relation. Okay? So, so... So it, 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 this is to say that our the personal what McMurray is saying here, and I won't go into it too much, but our personal development is our survival, right? So it's not a personal development; it's just built upon this thing that will survive some other way, like like a wolf or a bear or a badger, and then you put personhood on top of it. No, it's our personal development that will allow us to survive, and we'll, we'll go into that. So he cannot think for himself, yet he cannot do without thinking. So someone else must think for him. He cannot foresee his own needs and provide for them. So he must be provided for by another's foresight. He cannot do himself what is necessary to his own survival and development. It must be done for him by another who can or he will die. Right? So again, he is adapted to being completely unadapted, right? Um, now, is this helplessness merely a utilitarian function, or does it nurture and develop the personal, right? So is our crying and helplessness got, have some pure utilitarian property to it, or, or, is it or, or, or does it nurture and develop the person? So the baby's adaptation to his environment consists in his capacity to express his feelings of comfort or discomfort, of satisfaction and dissatisfaction with his condition. Um, so, I mean, one could argue, I suppose, that these are um, instinctual behaviors or instinctive behaviors um, but so I had something to say here um, let me just uh, piece it together but again an instinctive behavior adapts us to our environment right it's 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 a it's a behavior that doesn't have to be learned okay so this comfort or discomfort in a way evidences our very lack of adaptability to our environment so again if you want to say it's instinctive behavior you're you're going to get into semantics here right because if instinctive behavior is an adaptation adaptation to our natural environment in a behavior that doesn't have to be learned, in which we are competent functioning organisms that, you know, stand up and walk when we're born, then this isn't one of those. Okay, this is a, a, a let's say a, a way of acting that is not instinctive behavior. It seems to be something more, and that's what McMurray is getting at. It's moving towards development in the personal field, right? So. To come back to uh, what we're talking about, though, discomfort um, expressed by crying for which mum will try to find out the matter. If she can't, she'll consult another who might be able to. Um, so even in our, so in our discomfort by crying, we, we, we need to be responded to by 
by somebody, right? We can't think by our own lights, right? We require someone who can think, right? But it's obviously not us, right, to survive. So we are totally in thrall to whatever person out there has chosen to take care of us um, to think for us because we can't think for ourselves. We are not adapted. So, and if mom can't do it or dad can't do it, they'll go and consult a doctor, a nurse, someone who might, a midwife, you know. So we are, we are dependent upon relationship, right? In our immediate family and out into the community. Comfort, though, will express by satisfaction, right? His expression, of sa his expression of satisfaction is closely associated with being cared for, with being nursed, with the physical presence of the mother, and nat particularly with physical contact. It would seem to be, from a biological point of view, unnecessary. There is no obvious utilian, utilitarian purpose in this expression of satisfaction, because the cessation of cries... When Christ stopped, that would be enough to tell the mother that her effort, efforts had succeeded in removing his distress. It seems impossible to account for this expression of satisfaction, um, except as an expression of satisfaction in the relation itself, in being touched, caressingly attended to, and cared for by the mother. Okay, so so to paint that in other words, we... Um, when we are, um, many people will say that it's a merely a utilitarian impulse, that we cry for our mother to come to us, right? We'll cry for our mother to come and give us a hug and protect us from the bears and wolves. Um, but, we're, but in that, we're not doing service to the other side of that action. It would seem not only are we um, perhaps scared to be alone by ourselves, whether we're cognizant of bears, wolves, and whatever it might be, or not. The argument would be it's not, because that would give us some sort of instinctive behavior of our surroundings. The argument is that we don't have any of that, but we can say that we're scared to be alone, and we want a hug, right? So we're calling for our mother, but, but how do we explain, once picked up and given that hug and assured of our safety, of that sort of expression of satisfaction in the cooing baby, let's say, um, uh, that uh, how, how do we how do we account for that except for, well, it seems to be for the sake of the hug, for the sake of the relation itself. Let's dig deeper into that. So this is evidence that the infant has a need which is not simply biological, but personal, a need to be in touch with the mother and in conscious perceptual relation with her. And it's astonishing at what an early age a baby cries, not because of any physiological distress, but because he has noticed that he is alone and is upset by his mother's absence. Then the mere appearance of the mother or the sound of her voice is enough to remove the distress and turn his cries into smiles of satisfaction. So again, re re restating what I've just said, how do we explain that other side of the hug, you know? Not that, you know, granted that we're scared to be alone, we can say that, and, and baby cries because they're scared and alone, but how do we explain that other side, right? Um, how do we explain that satisfaction um, when the distressed is uh, removed and that smile? And that smile, as uh, McMurray says. Now, why why do we want hugs? So again, we're, we're, we're breaking down the point I've been making for the last couple slides. Why do we want hugs? For subconscious, irrational fear of predators, or for personal connection? So we often try to reduce infant response to Darwinian notion, e.g. babies are naturally scared of predators and therefore cry so that they are not eaten. And, and when I was, um, uh, when my wife and I did our uh, married couples, before they have babies or unmarried couples, whatever, before they have babies, you can do these prenatal classes, as they're called, where you go and you learn. Um, usually a woman will teach you, you know, teach the partners how a baby is born, what to prepare for, et cetera, et cetera. My wife and I went to one, and and uh, we kept on talking about, you know, 
how a woman produces ex extra oxytocin because lions are nearby and how how babies cry because they don't want to be left alone and eaten by a bear or a lion or whatever it is um, so this is this is this is radically within our zeitgeist within our culture this idea that we are merely organic beings that cry for this one particular instinctive behavior this reason but here we're trying to uh, counter that a little bit again here we use an analogy from the organic world and map it onto ourselves. But might we deepen this analogy of what the infant seeks in his mother's embrace to what we ourselves still seek in our embraces as adults? So when you receive a hug from your partner or from a family member or who, who, whomsoever it might be, are you merely running away from beers and bears and lions? Right? Are you merely um, wanting to alleviate fear? And just like one quick hug and then be like, all right, I'm okay. Or or are you doing it rather for something else, for the for this for the hug itself, right? The word we would use that we've been using in this class so far to explain this would be, are you doing it for its own for an end in itself? Right? So if it were merely a hug, if it were merely merely a hug to get away from danger, to get away from a predator or whatever it might be then it would be, the hug would be merely a means to an end, right? We would alleviate our fear in the hug, and it would be instrumental in this. Now, in a sense, it still is a little bit of a means in this, but at the same time, we remain in that embrace. And most of the time, what we want a hug for is for the hug itself. It becomes an ends, right? Um... Okay, so this isn't to say that there isn't a fear in being alone that we're trying to alleviate, but we must acknowledge another side of this action too. There is both a negative side in which we abolish fear, as well as a positive side, a personal connection, good for its own sake, an end in itself. Okay, so so there we go. I have um, hope I've I've made that clear. Um, just a sip of tea here. Okay, so as persons, we're social, top to bottom. So the infant must depend for his life upon the thought and action of others. The conclusion is not that the infant is still an animal, which will become rational through some curious organic process of development. It is that he cannot even theoretically live an isolated existence, right? So unlike that, that classical understanding of the development of the young with Aristotle, it is that he cannot even theoretically live an isolated existence. That he is not an independent individual. He lives a common life as one term in a personal relation. Only in the process of development does he learn to achieve a relative independence, and that only by appropriating the techniques of a rational social tradition. Okay, what does that mean, rational social tradition? Let's... Um, Let's go on to see here. Um, so the seed of reason, okay, this rational social tradition, what is it? From all this, it follows that the baby is not an animal organism, but a person, or in the traditional terms, a rational being. The reason is that his life and even his bodily survival depends upon intentional activity and therefore upon knowledge, okay? So intentional activity, and therefore upon knowledge. If nobody intends his survival and acts with intention to secure it, he cannot survive. So intention here, um, it, we're, we're moving back to the more the practical understanding of intention. McMurray isn't uh, a phenomenologist, okay? Um, though I'm sure he's aware of it and uh, applies some of it. But intentional, intentional means just as we would say, it's got purpose, it's got meaning. It, in the way that is, you know, like we have been saying, it's related to an object, right? It's related to a goal. Um, so if an infant himself doesn't have intentional activity yet, right? Doesn't have free action yet to choose between this or that thing and then intend one, right? 
because intending is like a choice we make, right? We can intend, intend many things, but I intend this one amongst others. A child doesn't have this ability of intentionality yet. Um, so if nobody intends his survival and acts with intention to secure it, he cannot survive. So he relies upon the intention, the intentional lives of others. So he can't li live at all by any initiative, whether personal or organic, of his own. He can live only through other people and in dynamic relation with them. In virtue of this fact, he is a person for the person. Uh, he is a person for the personal is constituted by the relation of persons. His rationality is already present though only germinally in the fact that he lives and can only live by communication. So, <clears throat> pardon me, just gaining my thoughts here. Um, so he isn't, he, he isn't a thinking intentional creature yet right? But in order to become one, I would think McMurray's arguing here, in order for him to become one, he has to start in a place where he is completely vulnerable, completely open to being, completely open to that dynamic relationship. Not even, not, 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 not just open to it, but actually absolutely um, uh, vulnerable his whole life vulnerable to it, right? To that open connection between himself and his mother, or herself and his, her mother. Um, and it's in this communication. So rationality develops as a dynamic movement between relational beings, between persons, okay? Another way of of saying this would be that um, well well the way when we were talking about Aristotle before um, and the classical view of um, the development in the young you know is, is that rationality comes naturally imminently out of our sort of um, enclosed selves now what McMurray is saying is no rather Rationality develops in this, again, this conversation, this dialogue between uh, mother and infant, this dynamic relationship, right? So it's not an insularity within ourselves that reason sort of emerges, but rather in relationship that he emerges. Rationality is that communication. So if an infant is totally without lights when he's born, she's born, you know, has no instinctive behavior, is completely vulnerable. This is that first open, hmm, first open disposition toward that development of that communication, right? We are an open receptacle, as it were, ready for that relationship um, to develop us and to intentionally form us, right, into um, a thinking, reasoning, intentional being. So the the, the, the infant's in essential endowment, in other words, is communication, right? This is the the the, the fundament, the bedrock of of what rationality is. And when we think about, you know, how do we reason? Well, we reason in language, right? We reason by talking to each other, right? Uh, language, we not, there's not a single word that comes out of our mouth that we ourselves have invented, right? We are, we are using a system of dynamic exchange, right? Of dynamic signs and symbols in order to uh, communicate with one another, okay? And this, 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 this is the scaffolding, the structure of reasoning, right? Um, so communication is seminal. Uh, to rationality. Um, and I, I would almost say to some sort of degree it's synonymous for uh, for McMurray, um, though there are, of course, conceptual distinctions that we need to make. But but that's not what we'll do here. Um, just We're just laying the groundwork. So 
let's read this. His essential nature, natural endowment is the impul impulse to communicate with another human being. Perhaps his cry of distress when he wakens alone in the night in his cot in the nursery has no meaning for him, not yet, but for his mother it has. And as she hurries to him, she will respond to it by calling, It's all right, darling. Mother's coming. All right, so, so here is where it begins. So everything I have said up till this point um, can be put, I believe, into a coherent essay of some kind, um, an explanatory essay um, in particular. Um, so that would be the first five pages. So if you know, you've noted um, on the reading that I, I said you, know, you only have to read up to this certain point, and then the last eight pages of the 13-page reading um, uh, you, you weren't um, responsible for. Um, so my expectation is in that first five pages you will be able to form um, the subject matter for an explanatory essay if this is the, 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 the reading you want to do. Now you can definitely go further into the reading and do more if you like to, but I think, I think the first major theme can be covered uh, basically breaking down that um, that sort of deceptive metaphor of organicism that we impose upon ourselves um, can be treated in those first five pages in a coherent essay. Now why I haven't why I've skipped this middle part of the chapter is largely because it gets into some very um, involved and detailed analysis of human development that kind of goes off the topic in a little way of, of the communication theme, um, of the I thou theme. No, not entirely. It, it, McMurray acknowledges that he has to sort of go off course for a bit in order to make a strong argument in the development of a child, um, not being merely instinct, instinctive. Um, but it sort of departs from the communication stuff. So, so I, I've kind of skipped it because I think too it would take another couple hours for us to go over, and that's what I essentially say in this slide. Um, so we will skip it and take out only a few points um, that help to further illustrate the communicative nature, or IU nature, of the infant's um, essential endowment. Um, so, so feel free to bring these themes too into any essay that you want to do on this on this on this uh, on this lecture, um, and feel free too to base it on. Um, my lecture slides here. So um, uh, McMurray goes into the theme of play and how the theme of play is um, also uh, has a um, an indispensable role in in our development as uh, in the young. Now this this applies to all um, I guess not all animals. I don't think fish and bugs play, but, but I think to all mammals it applies, um, or the most, what, who am I, um, David Suzuki, I don't know, but, but let's say uh, most animals that uh, uh, seem, most mammals seem to um, have, see, seem to play, okay, in this, in this developmental aspect. Um, so, First, animals in play are in general practicing, and so perfecting skills which are in some sense already present from the beginning. The child has to start from scratch and has to learn everything. All his skills are acquired. Okay, So animals in play are in general practicing and perfecting skills that they already have. Again, those pre-packaged instinctive behaviors um, that, that make them naturally adaptive. Um, are adapted to their environment. So in this sense, both animals and persons are developing through play, a growth in skill, and a growth in maturity. An animal, however, develops this in large part on its own. Right? A human person, on the other hand, does this in a relation. No, no, an animal, of course, does play with others a lot of the time. But 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 where that um, that development comes in, as we'll read right now, it. it is is more so in that relationship is um, located 
in the relationship itself, okay? Um, whereas the animal is already sort of rehearsing, refining those prepackaged uh, instinctive behaviors it already has. So play for the infant is not merely an exercise, importantly, as it is for, let's say, the animal, but a display of skill, a display of skill. The reference to the mother is pervasive in all the child's activities. He does not merely learn as animals do by instinct, help out by, helped out by trial and error. He is taught. So in play, um, in a sense, we are as humans learning how to learn. Okay? We're on display. Our mothers or our fathers direct us. Right, wrong, good, bad, better, worse. Right? That's not the right way to kick a ball. Don't hit your brother, etc., etc., right? We are slowly being intentionally formed by our parents, by someone of reason, um, in that we don't yet have that full capacity. Um, okay, so play continued. His acquirement of skills is an education. It is a cooperative process which requires from the start the foresight, judgment, and action of a mature person to give it an intentional form. Because of this, the child's development has a continuous reference to the distinction between right and wrong. He learns to await the right time for the satisfaction of his desires, that some activities are permitted and others suppressed, that some things may be played with and others not. He learns in general to submit his impulses to an order imposed by another will than his own and to subordinate his own desires to those of another person. He learns, in a word, to submit to reason, right? So he's being guided by reason, and himself in being guided by reason, and on display, being taught, learning how to learn, he himself or she herself is intentionally formed into a creature of reason, he, him or herself, okay? So again, that play is a display, not just an exercise, not a rehearsal, not a refinement of skills, but it's a display, right, that, that is guided by the mother or the father um, or the coach, let's say, at an older age. Now, though at that point, perhaps we are more in our reasoning capacities, but we're talking about, again, development in the, in the young, in the infant. Um, Okay, so unlike animals, uh, communication is definitive for the person. So it would, be a it would of course be possible to find in animal life instances in plenty which seem to be and perhaps actually are cases of communication. To take these as objections to what has been urged here would be to miss the point. Okay, so animals play and they're in relation while they play and they're in relation in other scenarios as well but that's that's not the point of what we're saying here or what McMurray's saying here for these for the animal are not definitive okay they'll have an impact surely on how they develop but they're not definitive on how they develop right uh, a dog um, if you took a dog into the middle of the woods and let's say could survive you gave it enough food and all that to survive on its own um, as a, as a young dog, it would arguably grow up to be a dog um, still, of dogness, right? He would have all the qualities of a dog, even though he grew up in the middle of the woods, uh, let's say raised by parrots. He would still be doggy, right? He'd still have a dogness to him. Whereas a human, and, and, and uh, we know this more now after the documentaries of the 20th century, written documentaries and in film documentaries of, uh, let's say, the wolf boys, um, the bo wolf boy raised by wolves, they take on the qualities of the wolves, right? That's what they learn. That's what we're open to. We have a totally amenable, uh, not amenable, malleable nature, right? Um, where we are open to relationship right from the get-go, right? And <laughs> if it's a wolf there, we're going to take on all the cues of a wolf, right? Um in ways that uh, in ways that uh, another species won't be able to um, in that same way. So, so, so again, relationship for humans is definitive on on our growth, on our development.
distinct from other animals. Okay? So in the human infant, and this is the heart of the matter, the impulse to communication is his sole adaptation to the world into which he is born. Implicit and unconscious it may be, yet it is sufficient to constitute the mother-child relation as the basic form of human existence as a personal mutuality, as a you and I with a common life. For this reason, the infant is born a person and not an animal. Okay. All his subsequent experience, uh, all his subsequent experience, all the habits he forms and the skills he acquires fall within this IU relationship, this framework. Um, uh, acquires, sorry, all the subsequent experience, all the habits he forms and the skills he acquires fall within this framework and are fitted to it. Thus, human experience is, in principle, shared experience. Okay? All right, so, so I hope I've made that clear. Um, uh, 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 of course, uh, like uh, we have in class, you're not here with me to um, challenge me in, in, in small details and to help cl me clarify um, all this information. Um, Again, so it's sort of kind of coming into our lecture here, like it helps me as a teacher to be in relation with my students in, the, in order to properly teach you guys, because it's a conversation, ultimately, uh, and it's a relational experience, or it ought to be. So, um, so anything that I have sort of fallen shy on, and as I reach the end, I think there's a, probably a couple points I could, I could be stronger on. Um, Bring those up into our phone conversation, or not our phone conversation, our Wednesday night uh, conversation on over Canvas. Uh, I think it'll be in the collaborate function. I'll send you guys an email um, uh, when I've set it all up and uh, give you instructions on how to join. Um, so meet me on Canvas, and we'll talk more on this theme. Um, now, if you um, if you've read the whole discussion. And you, if you read the whole text and you want to talk about the middle part that I've skipped, uh, you can bring that up. But I ask that you only bring it up if you've read it, all right? Because if you bring it up and you haven't read it, um, then I'll have to explain two hours worth of material to you. So, so better leave that um, unaddressed if you haven't read it. But if you have read it and you have questions on that middle segment, yeah, feel free to ask, um, and we'll fumble through some answers. And um, and uh, again, oh, um, what I want you guys to do tonight, as I mentioned in the email yesterday, um, is I, I, I want you guys to do for you, uh, uh, toward your participation mark for this class, I'd like you guys to sit down after this lecture and write a uh, essay outline on this lecture. Um, perhaps your, your title could be, um, as I think I mentioned before, you know, uh, why, is, why, why, why are human persons... Why, why can human persons not be considered organic? Or how does the development in persons differ from the, the development of um, um, animals, let's say, or uh, biological organisms? I don't know. Something of that kind of very broad question. And then bring in the themes of my discussion so far um, to help support that. So, so the outline should look, um, and you can look on our... Uh, intersubjectivity module where I've posted the um, examples of essay outlines. Um, use that model. Basically, I just want a title, a title that I would ask you to write a question. Even if it's a long, awkward question, better to start with a question, better to know what you're doing. Because again, if you don't, if you're, if you're writing an essay and you're not answering a question, then, you know, what are you doing, right? <laughs> you're, you're, you're trying to clarify something. You know, there's a question that's that's perhaps murky for you or murky for others, and you're trying to answer it. Um, so use the points from the... So, so, again, a title. I ask it to be a question. Write your thesis, the argument, and then what are your three points? Okay? And make sure those are distinct three points. If those are three points, uh, they might be too close in relationship, and they might overlap. So make sure you have three clear things to talk about that won't, um, you know, jump into each other too much. Um, you know, some people often write out three things that are actually the same point, 
uh, and then you're not going to have any clear lines of distinction between your paragraphs. Um, okay, so um, I will actually, you know, I'll ask you uh, that that'll be due Wednesday night, or maybe I'll say, you know, at Thursday night, because you can ask questions about the essay too in our discussion on Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Um, okay, guys, I'll leave it there. Um, talking on and on here, but at least I haven't gone to 90 minutes, so I'll spare you guys some time. Um, so, so again, I ask you uh, for a journal reflection for these um, lectures. I will ask you to attend the Canvas discussion at Wednesday at 6 p.m. And I ask you Thursday by midnight to submit to me a um, essay outline based on each lecture. And of course, the best way to probably do that is just to do it while I'm talking or um, while you're listening to the lecture or just after. Just get it done. It doesn't have to be that complicated. Um, and ultimately, what, you, what, I'll, what I'll have you guys all do is to choose one of these um, essay outlines um, to do your essay on, whichever one you feel most confident about. Um, this is to help you uh, get that second assignment done. All right, guys. I'll see you, talk to you Wednesday night. All best. Bye.